Okay, so I'm gonna move on to, to lab two. And so, you know, we've sort of been working on this toy problem, right, which is recognizing a single character. And the next thing that we wanna do is um, actually scale up to part of the problem that we really care about, which is recognizing um, the text from an entire line. And so this is, um, this is kind of how it fits into the lab. And so the goals here are, you know, move on from reading a single character. And another thing that we're gonna do is we're going to start by training this on a synthetic data set. Um, synthetic data sets are a really good tool for um, sort of prototyping and moving fast in, um, when you're working on a new problem because they allow you to kind of you know, make sure that you're building a data set that's exactly as difficult as you need. And you, know, you can do it without going and collecting a bunch of data. Um, and uh, the, the model that we're going to train on this is gonna be a sequence model with the CTC loss. And so the other goal of this lecture is to, or this lab is to um, explain the model that we're gonna use and how this loss function works. And yeah, so if you think about like kind of the, the network architecture that we're trying to create, this is where this lab is situated in it. We're focusing on the, the line text recognizer module. All right, so starting with a synthetic data set. Um, we have, if you go into the, um, the repo, for those of you that are following along on your computers, and then you go into lab two, and then notebooks. There's a notebook that says, let's look at EMNIST lines. So I'm gonna open that up. And so if you find this notebook, then this is what you'll see. Um, and so similarly to how we looked at EMNIST, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, you know, construct our EMNIST lines data set and then we're gonna load or generate data, so downloading the raw data, and, um, uh, and then you know, uh, loading that into our data set class. And then we're gonna inspect it, right? And so what we see here is that you know, the, this data set has like a few properties called you know, max length, max overlap, number of classes, um, and then we have some, uh, and then we have an input shape, which is images that are 28 pixels uh, tall and 952 pixels wide. And then we have, you know, we see that we have a training set here that has 10,000 examples and then a test set with 1,000 examples. Um, and so these properties, the max length, the max overlap, um, and the input shape are all sort of things that we can control because we're creating a synthetic data set. Um, and so again, you know, we, we can print out the mapping and it's the same as what we have for EMNIST. Um, and then we can look at, so we can like write a simple function that just says, um, let me take the, the Y label and let me, print out, um, let me print it out as a string. And so we can um, convert the Y label to a string and our, our labels are things that look like this. Right? So they're basically um, you know, sentences, but um, they're sort of, they're filled out to be a certain length by using these underscore characters. And so we can look at a bunch of these, right? So we can print out, let's say, nine um, example sentences, and we can look at sort of the label as text, and then we can look at what it looks like as a raw image. And this is what we see. And so what's really happening here is we're creating this synthetic data set, and the way that we're doing it is we're taking EMNIST characters, and then we're, um, we are sort of plotting them side by side with one another along this, along, um, along an x-axis. But since we don't want the spacing to be like totally uniform, we've, we're specifying some amount of overlap that we can allow the images to have. And so in this case, we're saying we can have at most 33% overlap between the images. Um, and so what's happening is that we're, you know, we're taking, we're sampling characters that correspond to these um, sentences. And then we're, you know, uh, and then we're placing them side by side with a random amount of overlap that is at most 33%. And so then this is the result that we get from the synthetic data set. And so this is kind of the first data set that we're gonna train this, um, uh, our, our line predictor on before we move on to using real data. All right, any, any uh, questions about this data set? 
information about your percentage of training and all those type of things? How do you um, I don't. I don't understand the question. Um, so let's let's take it offline because I, I think it's maybe not relevant to the to the data set that we're creating here. Um, but I'm happy to talk about it during the break. So yeah. The data set, the synthetic data set, is just generated from the original data set, but like augment, augmenting the data set. Yeah, that's that's a good way of thinking about it, right? So like, what we're doing here is we're saying, you know, I don't really know where we can go right now to find a big data set of handwritten uh, of handwritten text. But we do have this data set of handwritten characters. And so we're saying, like, OK, you know, we can create our own data set of um, handwritten lines of text just by combining these characters um, and using them to form sentences. And you know, this is not going to be a perfect proxy for the actual data that we care about, because you know, the overlaps might not be realistic, and the subsequent char characters might have different handwriting, and there, there won't be any cursive in here. Um, but it's a reasonable proxy for us to start working on this problem. The sentences come from a um, different data set that's, um, don't remember what, do you remember what data set we're using for that? It's like the brown corpus of text. I yeah. forget what it's from. So, so yeah, it's just a, it's a, a random like data set of sentences. Okay, other questions about this synthetic data set? Uh, how do we decide the maximum length? Yeah, that's just a parameter that we can decide. Like I think one way that you can, um, uh, one, one way that you can do this is you can just look at how long all the sentences are in your corpus. And you can say, like, OK, the longest one is our maximum length. Or you could say, like, maybe there's some outliers. And so we just truncate it at, um, like, the 90, 90th percentile of the longest sentence. I have a question. Uh, how do you deal with the problem that, like, this synthetic data set can actually be different from a real reading sample, right? Because you just align letters one to letter, one to another, but one person writes them. Yeah, so, so I think the question is, like, the synthetic data set is not like the real data in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, so, so again, like, the, the purpose of the synthetic data set is for prototyping. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to use this to test, like, whether we can come up with a good model architecture of this problem. Um, and then we're going we're gonna, to uh, evaluate that before we decide to invest in, like, a big data uh, collection pipeline for real data. All right, I'm going to move on. Yeah, I think just to add... It also allows us to start with a simple problem. I think you've said that also. But yeah, you just want to know, like we know a single character works. Can two characters next to each other work? Probably, right? So we can try that. And then what about you know, 80 characters next to each other? What if they're slightly overlapping? What if they're slanted? You know, what if they're slightly offset? What if there's noise? So we can yeah. tweak the complexity. And I think like one, sort of one of the principles um, I think for making machine learning systems that work, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow morning, is like you want to sort of gradually ramp up the complexity if you can. Like if you, um, you know, if you start with the hardest version of your problem, you know, millions of examples of like really crazy handwritten text, then it can be really easy to get stuck on that um, because you know um, maybe you have some bug in your model or maybe the data itself is just really difficult, and um, it's really hard to tell. You know, it's it's really hard to debug things when you're working on a difficult data set um, from the start. And so one thing that um, we recommend doing is, if possible, starting with a simpler version of your model that will allow you to kind of get everything else in place. And uh, you know, this synthetic data set allows us to tweak lots of things, right? Like we can, um, if it turns out that this data set that we built here, where there's like 33% overlap and you know, up to 80 characters, if that turns out to be too hard, like if we're not able to get good performance on that, then we could say like, well, maybe we have a bug. So like, let's make the problem even easier. Like, let's start, let's just do two characters, right, and 0% overlap, right? Like, that shouldn't be that much harder a problem than just predicting one character. And so we know that we should be able to solve that problem. And so we can use that even simpler version of the problem to, you know, eliminate any bugs in our code base and then ramp up the complexity gradually. And then only when we're comfortable that we have a system that actually seems to be working, then we can go and collect sort of the fully complex data set and actually start training on that. All right, so let's talk about um, a, what a neural network architecture could look like to read entire lines of text. Um, and so the goal here is, you know, we want to take a sentence that looks like this and then create an output that's a sequence of characters that corresponds to that sentence. Um, and so one thing that you could do is, like, if you just have, um, you can start by taking our um, our single character prediction model, right? So we're going to take 
um, a window of this line, and then we're going to pass that to a ComNet and get some outputs. And we'll softmax those outputs, and then that'll allow us to predict a single character. Right? So in this case, um, most of this box corresponds to a T. And so like, let's say that we'll predict a T. Um, and then we can just slide this, this, uh, this ConvNet down the sentence. And then what we hope will happen is that you know, in the first window, it'll predict a T. And then in the second window, it'll predict an H. And then in the third, it'll predict an E, and then so on. Um, but there's a big problem with this, um, which is like, how do you actually select the width of this window? Right? So in this case, the window is so big that you're getting both the T and the H here. Um, and so it's actually not clear which of those characters the model should predict. And we'll talk in a second about how to deal with that. Um, but an another thing that's, that could be helpful for this model is, um, so like maybe actually one way to deal with it is um, if you give the model some context. Right? So the first character, um, let's say the model knows that like, since most of this window is a T, um, it should predict a T. But then when you slide the window, you know, there's still a little bit, bit of T there, and there's also some H and then E. And so what, should the model predict a T, an H, or an E? If the model has some context from what the prediction that it made at the previous time step, then it can know, OK, the last character I predicted was T. And so um, the next character I should predict is the one that comes after that in this window, which is an H. Um, and so what we're doing is we're putting an LSTM on top of the sort of ConvNet fully connected stack that allows the model to look at its own previous predictions and use those as context to make its next predictions. Um, but you know, this different line spacing like, m might not be totally solved by this problem. Because for example, we have um, handwritten text. And different people write handwriting that, ha like, that is v like vastly different widths. Right? So um, for example, we can take the same sentence and someone might write it like this, and someone else might write it like this. Um, and so if we're not careful, then the, even though we have an LSTM that's providing the model context, it still might be ambiguous. right? Because you know, for example, like, um, in this case, like, entire sentences fit within the window. And so it's just going to be too hard a problem for the model to do unless we use a smaller window. Um, so we can make the, model, the window smaller. But then what happens when we go back to this larger text? right? So we can. Um, then when we slide this window, you know, we might have two windows in a row that are, that are looking at the T. And so it's not clear what the model should do with that. Um, and in the next sort of section, we'll talk about a loss function that we can use to alleviate that problem. But are, are there any questions about sort of the high level network architecture that we're going to use? Great. Um, and so the, the sort of the answer to this question is the CTC loss. So the intuition here is, um, let's say that we have um, a bunch of inputs. And those inputs, like you can think of as the windows that we had on the previous problem. So remember when we were looking at the small windows, and the issue was that uh, the window itself could look at the same character multiple times. Um, so that's kind of the situation that we're in here. And so if we have some inputs that are like our windows, um, we use those inputs to create an alignment. And that alignment is um, kind of what the model is seeing at each window, regardless of duplicates. Right? So um, for example, if, if two windows see the letter C, then we would just predict the character C twice. Um, and so you might get an alignment that looks like this. You predict C twice, and then A three times, and then T once. And then the question is, how do you combine that into something that's like a human readable output? Um, and sort of the rough intuition is, you want to take these duplicate characters and just squeeze them together into um, a single character. Um, and so that's essentially how the CTC loss works with um, one additional nuance. So you, um, like there are some words that have double letters associated with them. And um, uh, like for example, in hello, right, you have two L's in a row. And so if you're just squashing all of the subsequent characters together, like if the model predicts two L's in a row, then how do you know whether it's, a, whether it's a word that has two L's in a row or whether it's just the window is imaging the same letter more than once? Um, and so the way that the CTC loss deals with this is it adds, um, it adds these, uh, these epsilon tokens. And what these do are basically um, the process that you follow is you squash everything together, 
So you remove all the duplicates, um, and then that allows you to separate the two L's. Right? So if the model predicts three L's and then an uh, epsilon and then two L's, then um, w the process allows us to separate those two L's and predict two L's instead of just one. And so the remaining characters are the output. Um, so the, I guess the other nuance here is like, how do you, so we've sort of defined a set of rules for um, how you can use these, uh, these repeated character predictions to predict what the actual word is. Um, and so the, I'm not gonna go into the details of how you actually form a loss function from this. I would um, recommend checking out this blog post if you're interested. But the, the sort of high level intuition is you look at the, um, you look at the probability of each of the characters and then you, you, you use that to form a probability distribution over, um, over like this, a joint probability distribution over all of the possible um, outputs. So what is the likelihood that um, of any of the sequences that would correspond to the word hello? Um, and that's kind of the function that you're trying to, that you're going to optimize. Um, and then you just, so yeah, that's I think what I've already said. Um, and again, I would, I would recommend checking out this blog post if you're interested in looking at some more of the technical details. Okay, um, any questions about CTC loss? How do you arrive at a problem? When do you decide when you should use a different loss as opposed to a different architecture? Yeah, it's a good question. So when should you, when should you decide to use a different loss versus a different architecture? Um, I think there's just a bit of an art to this, right? Like I think it's, it's gonna be very problem dependent. And so I think this is where it's important to kind of try to study the literature of the problem space that you're working on. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't have much to add other than that. I think it's underappreciated, like the, the role of the loss function is not emphasized enough in some of the courses. And uh, Sometimes you have a single network with multiple kind of outputs with different loss functions on each one. That's pretty common in, in computer vision. Like one might be finding objects, but another loss might be recognizing objects, but everything below the losses is, is, is actually the same, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with that. So get, like, pick, yeah, maybe think more about the loss is the, is the advice. That's the takeaway. All right. Um, yeah, so the, the next thing I want to do is um, I, I don't want to talk about the details of how we implemented the, um, the line LCM with CTC, because there's just a couple of um, sort of nuances there that are not super important to understand right now. Um, but what I do want to do is go and see if we can train um, some of these models. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go into lab two. Um, and then I'm going to look at our tasks. Right, so we said that this contains um, the sort of training functions that we run over and over again. And so we have this task called train LCM line predictor dot sh. And so the easiest thing to do is just to run that. So this is going to run slower um, because it's an LSTM. And, uh, but right now it's just downloading the data and we'll see if we can get it to actually train. Um, but I guess in the meantime, are there any other questions about sort of the labs so far, like what we're aiming to cover in the labs, um, code base, why it's set up the way it is, um, how we've simplified the problem into you know, two really simple sub-problems, predicting characters, predicting synthetic lines of characters, and the model architecture that we've chosen? Yeah. So why do you choose to use the line detector heuristic before just doing the single character recognition? Well, like the complete rec the character recognition for the whole page. Yeah, it's a really good question. So why do we choose to just predict? Um, why do we choose to separate, cho selecting where the line is, and then uh, and then predicting the text rather than just saying like training a model to take an entire page of um, of text as an input and then 
you know, and then predict all the characters on that page as an output. Um, I suspect that, like in the long term, um, probably the the thing that's going to work the best is to like take an entire page of output and predict uh, an entire page of text and predict everything t uh, together. Because like a lot of the problems that you'll face with these line detectors is like, for example, sometimes people don't really write in a straight line, right? Sometimes the line is slanted, um, or you know, sometimes people don't necessarily like. Um, you know, sometimes like people will write things where like, oh, maybe they'll write in columns. So they'll write a few things here, and then the logic will go like this, and then they'll start over and have more logic going like that. Um, so I think like in the long term, if you really wanted to solve this problem, you would probably end up doing something that looks like what you described. But in the short term, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to break this down into problems that we know that we should be able to solve, right? So like, like taking a raw page of text and predicting everything on that, on that page seems like a really hard problem because it's like how do we um, how do we make sure that everything ends up in the correct order and like it just seems really far from the things that we know how to do but you know um, reading like if we have a single line of text and we can predict all the characters in that line like that seems like a very approachable problem because you know we know that we can um, we know that we can like do stuff with sequences and we know that we can make predictions on single characters so like combining those things seems pretty reasonable and then similarly like extracting a line of text from a page um, you know, that's, that's basically just like finding a bounding box um, or finding a bunch of bounding boxes on a, on a page. And so that feels like also an approachable problem. Um, and so, yeah, it's like the idea is just to, to try to um, isolate problems that we are reasonably confident that we can solve rather than tackling like the full difficulty um, research problem from the beginning. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's uh, there's definitely a lot of better ways to do it than this. This is, um, yeah. Um, so the question was like, aren't there better ways to do it than you know than what we were suggesting here? Um, and the answer is absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I would I would highly encourage you to try some of them out and just see if you can um, if you can make things work. So the question is, why, why do we detect lines instead of detecting words? No, the question is, uh, we go from characters to lines, but wouldn't it be easy to detect lines, detect words, like instead of bottom up from character to sentence, from sentence to word, and then if needed from word to separate characters? Yeah, so um, the question is, like, would it make sense to have an intermediate step where we predict words? Um, so maybe. I think, like, I suspect that that's going to make the problem a lot more difficult in some ways. Um, so, for example, if, um, for example, like, you know, when the nice thing about detecting lines is that there's, it's really easy to determine the ordering for them. So you just go from the top and you go down. But for detecting words, you know, when people write in like a way that's not straight, um, you might have like a bunch of boxes and you might miss detections for words. And so, um, like, figuring out what order to put those words in might be challenging. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the approach that you describe is also reasonable. Um, I, um, I think we, we chose this approach based on like how easy we thought it could be to get something working end to end. And then um, ideally what you do, like kind of part of this whole procedure that we're going through is we're saying like, okay, let's take the simplest possible version of our problem, make sure we can solve that. And then let's increment the difficulty a little bit. So, you know, um, characters to lines. Maybe also a reasonable choice is maybe characters to words. Um, but then we're going to make sure that we can solve that slightly more difficult problem. And then with the end goal of getting something um, working end to end, so solving our entire problem as quickly as possible. And then once we can do that, then like that's the time where we'd go back and say like, yeah, actually, you know, maybe a much better way to do this would be to predict words because um, we can also apply a language model to the words and we can see, you know, rather than just predicting each character um, 
independently, we can also predict the, char the characters in their context, right? So how likely is it that this character is an A, given that um, the beginning of the order was S and then T, right? And so you can do, there are all kinds of like way more clever things that you can do on top of this. Um, but we're trying, what we're trying to show you here is um, what is like sort of a minimal end-to-end -end system that you can get working and start seeing how well it works in production, collecting data, and then making improvements as is necessary. So there's a good question, which is probably be the last question. Is there anything else you want to do in lab? Uh, no. Yeah. Our training is working. Yeah. So the question is, how do you even decide what architectures to use? If you know state of the art, they, there can still be several architectures. Do you consider anything else? For example, code availability or talk, like access to people who've implemented it before yeah. or simplicity? Um, this yeah. isn't specific to the lab. This is a good, but it's a great question. Yeah. I think, yeah, part of the answer is, yeah, if you have someone who's implemented something like that before, then you should probably just have them do it again, and it worked. So that, that would be good. If there's code available and everyone says it works, then that would be good, right? Um, otherwise, I think simplicity is a great heuristic. Yeah. So. No, if, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about this tomorrow, about like sort of a really simple heuristic for how to pick the initial model that you use. Um, I think, uh, yeah. The other thing I'd say is, like, I generally don't place a lot of weight on whether there's code available because I, most um, machine learning code that you find online has is terrible and full of bugs. So, just be very, very careful about using that as a like choosing that as your reason for using a particular model. Yeah. So, and specifically, uh, the question asked about why we chose the CTC approach here. Mm -hmm. I think that's a combination of there's uh, great research that came out. Alex Graves is the researcher that really moved like RNNs forward, and it was using by, by by using CTC loss. So there's a research precedent. Then there's the CTC loss function encoded in TensorFlow, so we don't have to code it up, potentially make mistakes. So code availability that's good, and then it really fits the problem. Like it would be very hard to do other things like maybe bounding boxes for each letter, but that is more complex than just doing one thing and then feeding it through a loss. Great. Should we take uh, maybe one more question? Yeah, in the back. So typically in practice, how long do you give yourself to do this like simple end-to-end -end workflow? A week, two weeks? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I don't know that I have one answer for it. I mean, I think for something like this, um, I would say I would try to get, you know, I, I think like if you're for working on the character prediction, right? Like I would probably spend no more than a day making sure that you can do like reasonably good job of doing character prediction because it's a really well understood problem um, and you can train models for it super fast um, because the images are small. Then, you know, maybe you'd move on to line prediction and I might spend like you'd probably spend around a week on that, I would guess. Um, depending on a lot of different things, but you know, you'd want to be able to play around with different data sets and um, maybe play around with different model architectures. It might take you a while to realize that um, if, you've, you know, if you've already implemented something like this before, maybe it's on the shorter end of that. If you've like, never played with sequences of characters before, it might take you a while to figure out that you need CTC loss, for example. Um, and uh, so that could be like a week or it could be a few weeks. Um, and then yeah, and then I would just very, like, try to, I mean, I guess the one sort of piece of guidance I would have there is like, try to spend less time than you would, or, than you would think on like, each of the components and just try to get something end-to-end -end, uh, hooked up working as soon as possible so that you can like, be more um, guided about where you invest effort into improving models. So like, I would just get something that works reasonably well and then move on. All right, um, that's all that we have time for. Um, Next is lunch. Um, we just have lunch kind of right out in the main area over there, and we come back at um, 1 o'clock. Great, thank you.